Hello and welcome to On Geopolitics, the podcast that looks at geopolitics and historical context with myself, Ali Ansari, and my comrade in arms, Suzanne Rain. It gives me great pleasure. It gives us great pleasure, actually, to welcome back Donatis Kupchunas, who is a research associate at the Center for Geopolitics. Uh, you may, Some of you may remember him. He came and talked to us about Belarus some time ago, which was... Um, Really depressing. A a bit grim, wasn't it, Suzanne? A bit grim. Um, But today, today we're going to discuss the Baltic states and obviously the Ukraine crisis. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to be much cheerier, is it, Donatis? But uh, let's hope we can try and put some of the sort of historical background, um, you know, interrogate that a little bit more and see, you know, see what the context of these latest developments are. Good evening and thanks for having me. Very welcome, Donatis. One of the things that, so you're Lithuanian, um, you are a resident Baltic expert, um, and we wanted to focus on the Baltic states in the context of the war in Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, particularly because they've been notable as um, very, very strong supporters of Ukraine. And when you look at their sort of 20th century history, they have a very similar shape to Ukrainian 20th century history, by which I mean 1918 in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk uh, between Bolshevist government of Russia and the Central Powers, i.e. Germany and, and the Habsburgs um, and the Ottoman Empire. They, they were granted independence. They lost that in 1940. In 1944, they were all incorporated into the USSR, and in 1991, they were all they all de- declared independence. So, so, so you have four countries on the edge of Russia, in between kind of Western Europe and Russia, who've who've got this same historical arc to them. And so we wanted, we thought it would be brilliant to to sort of talk to you about understanding where the similarities are, where the differences are, and how that shared history leads us to the, the relationships that we have now between between the four countries. And we might bring Poland in a little bit as well, because Poland is obviously intricately linked to all of that. So um, that's my potted history, Donatus, but uh, is that all correct? So um, this combination of the Baltics and Ukraine is all ge- about geopolitics, um, we could say that geopolitics is the base of this sort of a region and the rest is the superstructure, if you will. You know, things like cultural affinity, historical memory and uh, so on. Um, Lithuanians, for instance, did not really care that much about Ukraine until it started revolting against uh, Russian dominance. Uh, that was in the early 2000s. And uh, the idea was that Ukraine escaping the Russian orbit uh, would uh, weaken Russia, but also that this would divert Russia's uh, attention away from the Baltic states. You know, uh, the more targets it has, the harder it is to concentrate on a single one. So there was this uh, geopolitical impulse first, and only then they started remembering and promoting historical ties with Ukraine and so on. Um, now, of course, it's true, as you said, uh, these countries share um, quite a similar historical um, arc. And uh, uh, here we'd be talking, of course, about the common history of uh, Lithuania, Poland and Ukraine. Uh, but but again, it's um, a history of uh, geopolitical rivalry between Russia and Lithuania plus Poland. Um the armies of the uh, Lithuanian Grand Duke Algirdas, for instance, at uh, one point were raiding Moscow, and uh, the Lithuanian Grand Duchy ruled over most of what is today's Ukraine. Um, you know, cities like Kiev, Chernigov, Poltava, or even Odessa near the Black Sea. When was when was that, Donatus? Yeah, can you tell us, give us an idea of the the, the time frame we're talking about? So um, it was in the first half of the. 15th century when uh, the Lithuanian Grand Duchy was at its max and uh, extended to the Black Sea but then territorially it went downhill from there Uh, uh, Moscow was getting stronger and uh, this pressure pushed Lithuania and Poland to unite 
which they did in uh, 1569. The new polity was called the Lithuanian Polish Commonwealth. It was a sort of a sui generis state with its very peculiar constitution, which actually amazed the British and other Western travelers. Um, just to give you uh, one example, the voting in in the Lithuanian uh, Polish parliament called Sejm, for instance, was on the basis of unanimity. So any single MP could ruin any legislation or even end the session itself. So you can imagine how passionate uh, were those legislative deliberations. Um, so this fascinating Commonwealth lost Kiev to Russia uh, by the end of the 17th century. And by the end of uh, 18th century, uh, the Lithuanian Polish Commonwealth was no more. As you may know, it was uh, partitioned between Russia, Prussia, and Austria in 1795. And the whole state just vanished from the map of Europe. Um, most of what's today is uh, Lithuania and also Ukraine and Belarus became part of the Russian Empire. And so it remained until the end of the First World War. Just, I'm sorry, Donatus, because um, for those of us who are less familiar with the intricacies, so, so what did happen at that point? It's a bit paradoxical, but all these nationalities of the Russian Empire uh, owe their subsequent independence first and foremost to the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia uh, that happened in October 1917. Uh, as you know, uh, the Russian Empire fought on the Allied side uh, that won the First World War. And it's uh, not winners of the war that are normally losing territory. Uh, but here come the Bolsheviks who uh, take power and who declare that they are withdrawing from the war in the end of 1917. Uh, Russia descends into a bloody civil war. Uh, the Bolsheviks are embattled and weak. And then the Central Powers basically, uh, at a gunpoint, force the Bolsheviks to cede them, the three Baltic states, Ukraine uh, and Belarus. And so they sign uh, treaties of Brest-Litovsk in March 1918. Um, of course, the idea of the Central Powers was to keep these territories for themselves, but then, in the end of 1918, uh, the Central Powers lose the war. So at this point, you have the perfect opportunity to escape the Russian Empire. Germany lost and is forced to withdraw from the occupied territories. Uh, but Russia is not a winner either. So you have this power vacuum in the region or uh, this window of opportunity, if you will. And so the so-called wars of independence begin then. Uh, there are all sorts of skirmishes. Lithuanians, for instance, are fighting both Poles, Bolsheviks, and the so-called Bermontians, um, which is um, a mixture of Germans and Russian whites. Latvians and Estonians are being uh, helped by the British Navy, and Poles are wrestling pretty much everyone around, including the Ukrainians. Um, but the dust finally settles with the signature of the Riga Peace Treaty of 1921, which um, ends the Polish-Soviet War. And uh, this is where the fate of Ukraine is sealed, uh, whereby its western part with Lviv becomes part of Poland, while the rest becomes the Ukrainian SSR. Ali, do you want to ask something? Yeah, I was. Just, I mean, just to clarify that, because I think it, again, it, uh, for our for our listeners, I mean, bearing in mind that obviously Poland in um, uh, in, in in after the Great War, in a sense, was 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 first of all a much larger state, and and, and further east, wasn't it? So, I mean, we're, we're we're talking about Poland, I suppose, at the time being the largest of the of, of the states, contra Russia. Then, obviously, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, but they were looking, I suppose. Um, with much more anxiety towards the east, is that right? I mean, they were looking. I mean, Russia was seen to them in some ways to be an equal, if not greater threat, I suppose, to their independence than than than, than Germany. Am I right or wrong? 
I think uh, it depends who you ask and when. Um, if we talk about Poland, uh, Polish dictator Józef Pilsudski, for instance, um, always thought that the main threat was Russia and that it needed to be pushed as far east as possible, which he tried to do. But his major opponent, Roman Domowski, thought that Germany was the arch enemy. Uh, but Poland had more enemies than those two. It fought Lithuania for Vilnius, which it eventually annexed. It fought Ukrainian nationalists. It quarreled with the Czechs of uh, Teshin. Um, now, if you asked Lithuanian nationalists in 1919, uh, who is your worst enemy? They would say that it was Poland because Lithuanian nationalism itself was mainly anti-Polish. Uh, and Lithuanians were even uh, flirting with the Soviets against Poland. Uh, now, in case of Germany, it was like a, a midwife in the birth of these uh, three Baltic states. It helped them uh, militarily, financially, and so on. Uh, but then, of course, it all changed in uh, 1933. So, post-war Central Eastern Europe was quite, uh, as they say, uh, dynamic. This is one of the things that this is one of the things. Every time you start digging into these relationships, you you realize how how intertwined and complicated it is because it's not it's never straightforward for those countries that are balancing between different countries to say, well, this they've always been on this side or they've always been on that I side. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing you say, and I think Suzanne's picked up on this, I mean, the interesting thing you say is, of course, that we look at the region in the, from the perspective, really, of the Second World War and, and see essentially Poland as, you know, one of the victims, obviously, of that of that period. In a sense, you know, what you're highlighting here is that the, 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 the great power politics or the power politics of the interwar period really viewed you know, obviously, the relationships between those various states was quite different, and Poland was often seen as a, a as a potential threatening power by the Lithuanians. I mean, that's what you're you're highlighting. And, and I think the other issue, Donatus, which which actually go, going back to the kind of um, Imperial Germany times, you have these population fragments as well, don't you, in the Baltic? So you have you have Russians and you have Germans as well as. Estonians and Latvians and Lithuanians. So it has the that sense of identity of being a Lithuanian or of being a Latvian or being an Estonian. How how established is that? Do you mean today? Well, kind of uh, yes, today. But but actually, I suppose I'm talking about a hundred years ago when when they were new states. All right. So I think. It would be good if I just focused on one of those uh, nationalities about which I know most. So if, if you ask the Lithuanian speaker a question, um, who are you? And uh, if you asked this, let's say, in 1850, uh, your specimen would not necessarily tell you that they were Lithuanian. They might say that they were Catholic, or uh, Samogitian, which is one of those regions in Lithuania. But if you ask the same question in 1930, uh, most would already understand the question exactly in the sense in which you, Suzanne, are asking it. And this is because of the campaign of agitation uh, by Lithuanian nationalists that began in the end of the 19th century. And uh, the idea of Lithuanian identity that they tried to sell was really simple. It was based on Lithuanian language uh, plus Catholicism and it also had an element of class as it was a bit of a revolt against uh, Polish-speaking landlords. Uh, now, when we come to 1919, um, this sort of linguistic identity was being challenged first uh, obviously by by communists who maintained that all ethnic nationalism was rubbish and that what mattered was an international class of the proletariat and then it was also challenged by those poles 
who were seeking to integrate Lithuania into another Lithuanian Polish Commonwealth. And um, they were trying to convince the population that uh, these Lithuanian nationalists were German agents and that everyone would be uh, better off in a common state with the Poles. So, to answer your question, um, how established was this Lithuanian ethno-linguistic identity? I'd say it was still kind of um, fragile in 1919. And then there was another problem for Lithuanian nationalists. If you take the ethnic map of the Vilnius region in 1918, for instance, there were around 2% of Lithuanians in the city, and the countryside was a mix of Lithuanians, Belarusians, Jews, and Poles. And so how can you claim it as Lithuanian? <laughs> so this this was quite a headache for Lithuanian nationalists who wanted Vilnius as their capital. Uh, so what they did was uh, they claimed Vilnius on the basis of history, saying that uh, Vilnius has always been the capital of Lithuania. And they also said that these Belarusians and Poles, for instance, in, in, in the region, were sort of damaged and denationalized Lithuanians and that they had to be re lithuanized Just going also back to the identity issue, I mean, under so under Tsarist Russia, under the Russian Empire, were, were these distinctive uh, provinces in that? I mean, was there, a, was there a, a province of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia? I mean, were they present before the dissolution of the Russian Empire, or did they re-emerge in 1919? What's the, what's the basis? Um, administratively, the Russian Empire was divided into a bunch of governorates, or gubernias in Russian. Right. And in case of the Baltic states, they did not uh, necessarily coincide with the ethnic map of those regions. So yes, there was an Estonian governorate, there was a Livonian and Courland governorates, and out of those three you can um, make today's Estonia and Latvia. There was no Lithuania governorate in 1917, um, and independent Lithuania was made out of uh, Kaunas, Vilnius, and Suvalki governorates. There are so many... There's. I don't think we've got time to go into all of these things, because I also want to ask about um, about religion, and and that I know is complicated, because you have this sort of strong Catholic belt certainly in Lithuania but also there's the um the orthodox church mm. uh, it, it means what's so interesting now in in the Russia Ukraine war is the way that the orthodox church has been used by Putin to justify or or sort of authorize Russia's activities and and then there's some really complicated splinters aren't there with I don't know how else to say this, the Ukrainian faction of the Orthodox Church, which um, which holds a different view. How does how does religion play a role in national identity in the Baltic states? So here these Baltic states are different uh, because Lithuania is uh, Catholic and uh, Latvia and Estonia are mostly Protestant. Uh, I always had an impression that religion has been more important in Lithuania than in those other two states. Um, the first battles that Lithuanian nationalists fought um, in the end of the 19th century actually took place in churches. Uh, they would literally wrestle uh, Polish speakers in church because they weren't happy with Polish as the uh, language of uh, church service. And they were... Um, demanding uh, the Lithuanian language. And then um, when Lithuania became independent, many Catholic priests uh, were also doing politics on the side and they were quite influential. And also, um, of course, religion was a major barrier separating Lithuanians from uh, Jews and uh, Russians. It's interesting because you, you fast forward to the... 1980s and the the role of Pope John Paul in in Poland in in mm -hmm. sort of supporting the solidarity movement and bringing about the end of Soviet Union's influence in in Eastern Europe. 
Oh yes, absolutely. Catholicism was yeah. very important. Yeah. I mean, are, are you? I mean, are, is one of your arguments? If I, mean, I don't want to put any words in your mouth, Donatus, but let me suggest something. When you're looking at the composition of the Baltic states, Poland and, and the others, and and obviously the historical frictions that have existed to greater or lesser extent. I mean, we, we don't want to exaggerate them, but clearly there are differences, as you're highlighting. I mean, are you suggesting in some ways, or would you say that perhaps even today, if we bring it up to date, that these, you know, these frictions may exist under the surface still, that the sort of unity against uh, what we see as the, you know, the, well, you know, Russian behavior now and, and Russia and Ukraine that has fostered a certain unity, certainly among the Eastern Europeans. Um, to what extent do you think that perhaps it's not quite as uh, uh as unified as being presented i mean I, I you can see a strong case for the unity but to what extent is the unity really contingent precisely on this or sort of russian behavior i think in general situation with the minorities isn't too bad in the baltic states here we would obviously need to talk separately about lithuania and its two northern neighbors because as you may know national composition of those states is quite different I think a quarter of uh, Latvia's population and Estonia's population is um, Russian. And cities like Riga is like one-third Russian. Um, and one of the major issues in Latvia and Estonia was uh, actually citizenship. Um, after 1990, these states did not give citizenships to uh, the Russians automatically, while Lithuania gave it to everyone. Um, and in Lithuania, it's, it's actually the Polish minority, which is the largest. Um, and um, this national composition also translates into foreign policy. Um, Lithuania has been the most hawkish uh, towards Russia because it <laughs> has just 5% uh, of Russians. Um, but it's hard to talk about the allegiance of Baltic Russians because it's quite nuanced. Um, some of them, of course, watch Russia's channels, but they're not too keen on living under Putin. And of course, Estonian and Latvian governments are fighting for the hearts and souls you know, of the Russian speakers. Uh, so they have um, their uh, local TV channels in Russian language and so on. Is there, I mean, is there, in your, is there in your view a serious prospect, for instance, of there being sort of civil and, and other unrest in, in the Baltics? I mean, certainly in Latvia and Estonia. I mean, if you've got such a, a, a large minority of Russians, I mean, is that a, is that a serious uh, possibility? And not from inside and not from outside either, I think. Uh, the Baltic states are much more prosperous than Russia. So there is really no incentive to rebel and uh, in the last 32 years Russia has never resorted to anything in the Baltic states like they were doing in Ukraine uh, because Russia really treats the Baltic states as a sort of uh, American colonies and in this respect there are clear rules of engagement uh, with NATO countries they even do not interfere in politics of those states uh, that much because it would be uh, very hard to do if they uh, tried. And uh, Russian priorities are obviously uh, elsewhere. Tanat, can I, I, I'd like to ask, uh, we talk, we've talked a lot about history, and I think that, that that was really important because history is so much shaping how people think now. And I was thinking particularly, there have been a couple of... Um, sort of powerful moments, most notably the president, oh, sorry, the prime minister of Estonia, Kaya Kallas, who's been very articulate about how growing up in Estonia in the Soviet Union um, formed her sort of lifelong belief in, in the power of freedom. And then, and she spoke very movingly about her father taking her to Berlin when she was a young girl and taking her to the Brandenburg Gate and saying, look over there, that's, you know, you can breathe freedom if you breathe in deeply. And of course, we, I mean, I, I can, you know, my grandfather was in the British Navy in the Second World War. It's, it's, it's still in living memory, some of these things which, which really form things. So if we, if we really remember that the people leading these countries 
grew up in the Soviet Union, it's it's a lot easier for us then to to realise why people have such a strong and instinctive reaction. So I'm just going to read some of the things that Kaya Kalas has said. I and mean, she, she, um, she's given a couple of very powerful speeches. And in this one, she said, when we look at Russia, we see darkness. Fear is keeping its society together. And we see thousands fleeing the country. We know this fear, fear of secret police who seize people in the middle of the night or arrest them only for holding up placards in public squares. Fear of the constant distrust, fear to express your opinion, fear of the atrocities that might follow. Tens of thousands of Estonians fled this same tyranny after World War II. And indeed, uh, who was it? It's the um, president of Latvia, Egils Levitz, who who actually his family, he's a um, Latvian Jewish family, who were expelled um, in 1972 from the USSR for dissident activities. So he grew up in Germany and only came back um, in 1990. Um, so you have this kind of, there's a really sort of deep memory of what living in the Soviet Union felt like. And indeed, Andrzej Duda, the president of Poland, said when when the four presidents, Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, went to see President Zelensky, he said, we know this history, we know what Russian occupation means. And, and I suppose the question is, can, can any of these countries, is, including Russia, escape that history? Or, or is everybody kind of doomed to be so influenced by their experiences of it that, that all the judgments they're making now are based on how everyone behaved before? That's a good question. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking if there is a good example here of uh, escaping history, as you say, one thing that comes to mind is Lithuanian and Polish relations. As you know, in the interwar period, uh, Poland uh, snatched Lithuanian capital Vilnius and annexed it. And there have been no diplomatic relations between the two countries until pretty much the Second World War. And after the breakup of the Soviet Union, Lithuania started demanding uh, an official apology, which Poland refused. And so there was a conflict. But what helped to get over this was that these countries were now in the same geopolitical basket. They both wanted to join the EU and NATO, and so there was no place for this sort of bickering anymore. And this makes you wonder, what if Russia was in the same geopolitical basket? Would uh, history play that big of a role? Um, I don't think so. But now, when they are sort of enemies, and especially after Russia attacked Ukraine, uh, history is being weaponized. Lithuanians, for instance, are uh, taking down, you know, Soviet monuments just to show Russia a middle finger, and uh, the Russian minority, of course, is not happy about that. But actually, so Donato, so that's where the existence of these substantial. Russian minorities in Estonia and Latvia are a really interesting case, not least because you you know you arguably you have you have the same issue in in Ukraine. Yeah, I, w- I wanted to yeah just follow on because I think that's an important. But you mentioned earlier that it depended what the Russian state did to sort of almost like trigger these populations. But you know, I was wondering where where are their loyalties in your view? I think it's a mixed bag. Um... As I said, there are those who watch Russia's TV channels and believe them. Um, There are those who watch those same channels but do not really believe them. Um, And there are those Russians who are pro-Ukrainian. There are, of course, some frictions. Um, I've recently heard from one of my Estonian contacts that with all this influx of Ukrainian refugees, uh, uh, there are tensions between them and uh, local Russians who support Putin. Um, but otherwise, I don't really think that Russian minorities in general are any um, serious threat to the Baltic states, mm. even at present. Are there any indications, so you probably don't know the answer to this, but um, are there any any indications that, that, that Russian-speaking um, people from the Baltic states have gone down to Ukraine to fight with the Russians? I don't believe that it's a large number. 
Um, I think it's something still quite rare. And I think more people from the Baltic states have gone to fight on on the Ukrainian side than uh, vice versa. But it, but it's interesting, you know, what you say, because in some ways this is the dog that hasn't barked, hasn't it? I mean, you would have thought if you had 40% of your population was Russian, that you would either be you know, very wary of that and not wanting to necessarily provoke internal strife. You might also think the Russians themselves or Putin himself would be working on that to sort of like disrupt the uh, domestic politics of these countries. But in fact, nothing's happened. From what you're saying, nothing. I mean, they're not even going to, they're not even showing a, a degree of, you know, loyalty to the Russian cause in actual fact. Um, it, it's, it's, it's much calmer, I suppose, in some ways than maybe we, we might have anticipated. Or is it? Or is it? I mean, that's the question, isn't it? Or is it? I mean, that's the way we're seeing it, aren't we? I mean, is it? I don't know. Well, if we're talking any sort of active participation in hostilities on the Russian side, I mean, you really, really have to love Putin in order to risk, you know, getting killed or returning without your limbs. So I don't think Russians in the Baltic love Putin that much. In terms of the, the policy of the Baltic states towards Russia. I mean, do you think that in, in some ways, I mean, my reading of it, so the way I would look at it, I'm far from an expert on the Baltic states, but the way I would see it is that history basically has determined the way in which the Baltic states will approach Russia. You know, they, they have had that experience of, you know, what they would say, occupation, obviously the Soviet experience. They're very, very worried about um uh, you know, what Russia might represent in the future, and therefore they've moved quickly to align themselves with the West. Uh, there's always been this sort of anxiety, I suppose, that, as you say, with the, with, the, with, the, with the population mix, that, you know, they've got to play that, you know, quite carefully. On the other hand, you know, what I'm reading, but, you know, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, Donatis, I mean, that's your role. Uh, basically, you know, what I'm saying is that actually their policy seems to have been quite, you know, they, they've played their hand quite well, haven't they? I mean, Essentially, they don't have domestic disruption. They stood up to the Russians. Uh, they've done the right thing. They joined NATO. You know, look what happens when you don't join NATO. I mean, you know, this is the, the, so for them, in a sense, they have played that hand well. I mean, is, 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 am, I, am I wrong or what would you say? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the Baltic states are a success story. Uh, if you look at where they were in 1990 and where they are now, it's a huge leap, um, I mean, economically, and um, also they're obviously more secure uh, within NATO. And NATO is also good for business, because business uh, likes stability, and NATO provides that. Uh, of course, there were a few critical decisions that had to be made, um, but they're really never... Uh, have been any serious debate that Baltic states could choose a different path. In Ukraine, it was, of course, a bit different. It was always torn into these two different directions. Uh, and, of course, the major difference was that uh, Russia never claimed a free hand in the Baltic states since 1990. But they thought very differently about um, Ukraine. And, and can I ask you, can I ask you, so we, we discussed earlier the relationship with Poland, but is the relationship with Poland now quite tight? I mean, is it, are they, do they, do they see themselves as one block, say within the EU or within, is there sort of like this Eastern European block? Oh, yes. Uh, and Poland leads that block. And uh, they feel that they're all in the same boat when it comes to Ukraine. Can can I say as well, because the other thing that, that has happened, and actually this is where Ukraine um, has obviously had this huge um, sort of bringing together force, because um, particularly Poland and, and Lithuania have a long history of supporting Belarusian oppositionists and and now Russian oppositionists. So, so you already have this... Um, sort of strong sense of being the states which are there to provide a safe place for people who are threatened from political persecution, which obviously goes back all the way to the history again, where they, they remember how they had to, to fight to liberate themselves. And so you see then this, for me, when I'm watching the, 
the way that um, the Baltic states and Poland are relating to Ukraine, it's it's only really comprehensible in that context of of that shared experience of of such a horrible time and and the work that they've done either by design or default together to support people who are still going through it. I don't know, maybe that's, is that too rosy a view, Donatus? Are you going to tell me it's not like that at all? Yes, but as I've said, the base is really geopolitics. And what you've mentioned is what comes after that, I think. These states basically fear Russia. Um, And as one of my Polish academic friends uh, told me recently, it's better to fight this war in a territory that's uh, not your own. So sometimes it might seem that the Baltic states and Poland are even more enthusiastic about fighting Russia than Ukrainians themselves. And of course, you can afford to be that enthusiastic if you are fighting Russia by someone else's hands. I'm going to I'm going to respond to you with some inspiring quotes from um, from our Baltic leaders. Because again, Kaya Kala said, gas might be expensive, but freedom is priceless. It is up to every government to decide how much of the burden its people are ready to carry. But it's equally necessary we get the message through to our people. What is our neighbour's problem today will be our problem tomorrow. We are in danger when the neighbour's house is on fire. I think that's the opposite of what you just said, which is it's fine if the neighbour's house burns because at least it isn't ours, which... Of course, I mean, not only Estonians, I think, but the whole world feels like that because they don't like uh, states invading each other. But uh, this quote precisely shows, I think, that uh, what they care most about is their own security. They fear a spillover of this fire into their own countries. So it's better to let it burn and uh, run out of steam in Ukraine. But uh, what interests me most as a diplomatic historian is uh, could this war have been avoided? Because a bad peace is better than a good war. And if it could have been avoided, uh, then uh, what mistakes have been made? uh, By whom and when? And uh, these questions, I think, would bring us back to 2014 or even earlier. Can you give us us a sort of a brief rundown of what you know, how, how you saw that, the developments in 2014 for, for people who wouldn't really be familiar with it. So there was this uh, revolution in Ukraine in February 2014, uh, huge demonstrations and riots in Maidan. Pro-Russian President Yanukovych is uh, kicked out of office, basically, and uh, runs away to Russia. And what provoked these protests uh, was Yanukovych's decision not to sign an agreement with the EU. That was the pro the, the, the uh, EU association. Exactly, yeah. yes. And that's why uh, this revolution is also called uh, Euromaidan. Uh, and this was the point when Russia decides to attack Ukraine. Uh, Russia saw the revolution as a coup directed by the Americans, as they usually see things, uh, which sort of... Um, snatches Ukraine from what it sees as its backyard. And there is this episode just before the revolution when Lithuanians and others are pressing Yanukovych to sign this agreement. And Yanukovych is uh, saying, look, there is this guy Vlad in Moscow who threatened me that if I do this, they are going to do something really drastic. And in response, uh, Lithuanian president was just taunting him to, you know, man up and sign. And and I'm not sure that disregarding Russian threats was a responsible or a wise thing to do. But do, do you think he shouldn't have done it? I think that Russia should have been schmoozed into this gradually instead of saying, you know, it's none of your business and uh, bug off. Uh, Ukraine's NATO membership was a non-starter for Moscow, but some sort of association with the EU probably could have been worked out. And for anyone who knows Russia at least a little bit, the only way you could forcibly detach Ukraine from the Russian orbit uh, was war. And there was never another option, really. 
and the Baltics, Poland and the West still took that gamble against all the rules of geopolitics. But surely, but uh, so you say the rules of geopolitics, and it's an interesting point there, but you know, what I will, as a counterpoint to you, say surely the way in which Putin and the Russians, let's say in general, should have addressed this was not to go down the route of increasing authoritarianism, increasing repression at home, which in a sense were only doing exactly that, were pushing the Ukrainians in the other direction. Had they not gone down that route and maybe approached in a sort of a, even a semi-liberal state or whatever you want to call it, you know, not necessarily a fully Western, but a, a, a more moderate state, then perhaps the Ukrainians wouldn't have felt that uh, that yearning to to turn to the West. I mean, I, you know, it's it's a, it's a difficult because in a sense, what we're saying here is is back to that great power politics realism that uh, I think Mir Shimer and others argue, which is you know obviously quite controversial. I mean, you know, this idea that simply because the Russians don't like it or Putin doesn't like it, you know, we have to we have to accommodate. I mean, doesn't that become, you know, let me be very provocative here. I mean, doesn't it become precariously close to sort of appeasement? I mean, in that sense, in a sort of a 1938 type of mode, that these are great powers, they have rights, they've made their unhappiness clear. Therefore, we have to, we have to bend to that. I but mean, I think, Ali, I'm going to answer this, because I okay. think what Donatus was saying was that essentially you had... You had divergent forces, yeah, which, which could, which made conflict inevitable. And in fact, the the, the way that you asked your question there to me just highlighted um, the kind of the the truth at the heart of this, which is that Russia and Ukraine ceased to understand each other, mm. and they ceased to understand each other because their populations were completely different, and their life journeys were completely different so 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 the the longer russia thought that ukraine was still in one form and 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 carried out a set of actions based on that assumption the greater the divide became so so you can kind of look at it and you say no wonder everybody said when when in 2008 with the the uh Russian action in Georgia and then 24. No wonder everyone who understood Russia said, you have to watch this. And actually, no wonder people in the UK were saying, I mean, you know, we'd had the use of radiological and chemical weapons yeah. in the UK by the Russian state. You know, they're not the actions of a state which is seeking to find a stable place within a community of other mm-hmm. states however hard you might say well you need to balance russia it's it's russia doing the destabilizing mm-hmm. of course i completely agree uh no one wants to be friends with russia these days uh, for good reasons and ukrainians in particular because <laughs> they know how it all works right um, but you know we can treat russia as a constant here in our this sort of modeling because you cannot change it. And there is very little hope that it is going to change on its own in the foreseeable future. Now, what you can change is your own behavior and how you adapt to this reality. And one of my favorite quotes is that you can ignore reality, but you cannot ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. That's almost as depressing, Donatus, as our last podcast with you about Belarus. I mean, you know, the idea that Russia might not change. I mean, I suppose we'd like to think that there could be a path to democratization for Russia. I mean, surely. Uh, even Suzanne is shaking her head. Oh, my God. I'm the only optimist on this podcast. I'm also thinking, Ali, that we've had 45 minutes, which is the ah, critical cutoff ah, time. And maybe this is just the cliffhanger, good. Which, <laughs> <laughs> which we shall come back to on another day yeah. because it's a whole other topic. Well, I, I mean, I think one of the topics that we're going to have to discuss is are there pathways to, democ- uh, to a democratic settlement? I think we should discuss that, Suzanne, at some stage. I mean, our states... Not now, though. No, not now. No, not now. No. <laughs> But I think I think in a future podcast we may have to come back and discuss that. So anyway, uh, I'm getting a, a very vigorous sort of uh, shaking of the head from Suzanne there, telling me to finish this. So I'm going to finish that. I'm going to thank you very much, Donatus, for your uh, for your contribution uh, today. Uh, this is your second contribution, but it's not your last. I can assure you. So we shall get you back at a later date to uh, hopefully continue this discussion. So um, that's. Uh, 
thank you from me and bye from me. And from me too, Donatus. Thank you very much.